So I appreciate the opportunity to present data today from the updated results from the Keynote 189 study. Uh, the Keynote 189 study has become a, uh, a, a real standard in terms of what we treat our patients with. And the Keynote 189 study was a study that was specifically for patients with non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer. Um, the reason for a study that would be specific for non-squamous disease, of course, is that uh, in many patients who have non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer, the standard approach is uh, platinum plus pemetrexid, at least traditionally, um, over the last several years. And uh, pemetrexid is not used in, in squamous disease. So this study specifically looked at non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer. Patients were randomized between carboplatin and pemetrexid uh, for, uh, for induction cycles followed by maintenance pemetrexid, and uh, there was also a placebo that was added in the control arm. In the study arm, the combination was between carboplatin, pemetrexid, and pembrolizumab. Uh, pembrolizumab, of course, a PD-1 uh, inhibitor that is uh, commonly used in the management of patients who have non-small cell lung cancer. Um, one thing that was uh, unique about this study was that it actually was stopped very early at the first interim analysis. Um, and uh, in many respects, as I will explain, that makes the updated data even particularly relevant. So the, uh, the study design was that patients would continue pembrolizumab for a total of, uh, of two years and pemetrexid was continued uh, per standard, which was generally to continue it indefinitely. Uh, the original data when it was uh, presented and published uh, was uh, very compelling. And as you can imagine, you would need to have very compelling data in general to have a study stopped at the first interim analysis. Uh, at that first interim analysis, the hazard ratio for overall survival was, uh, was less than 0 0.5, meaning that at any point along the curve, you were more than twice as likely to be alive if you were randomized to the arm that included uh, pembrolizumab as opposed to the arm that included placebo. Uh, the tolerability also was quite good for the regimen and the progression-free survival um, looked similar in terms of the hazard ratio with, again, striking results in favor of the combination of carboplatin, pemetrexid, and pembrolizumab. However, one of the sort of weaknesses of any data set when it would be stopped at such an early time point is that the follow-up was uh, very limited at the original uh, presentation and publication of the Keynote 189 study. Um, so, for instance, even though Pembrolizumab was supposed to be continued for a total of two years as part of that study. Uh, there was almost nobody who had, in fact, continued uh, for that long. And in fact, um, the, the follow-up uh, was limited to 21 months or less in that original analysis. And so as part of the analysis that was presented uh, at, uh, you know, at, at ASCO, there was uh, an update and there was a focus on both updated data and uh, PFS2. PFS2 is sort of the length of time until progression, um, including a second progression, um, and to look and see whether or not uh, there, were, uh, there were effects in terms of, of for instance, people maybe um, doing better if they were um, on one of the arms versus the other uh, in, on their, their next line of therapy in addition. Um, one other striking feature of the Keynote 189 study is that um, whereas we know that there is a strong correlation between the likelihood of a good outcome uh, for single agent PD-1 inhibitors uh, for patients of high pd one expression, the uh, hazard ratios for patients who uh, were in three different categories was actually quite similar. Those categories were patients who have generally shown the best outcomes to date with pembrolizumab, of those who have standing for pd one in at least half of their cells, as well as patients who had 
uh, staining for PDL1 in uh, a minority of their cells, and then a group of patients who have no staining for PDL1 seen on their cells. Um, the outcomes were strikingly good in all three of those subsets in the original report. Um, so what was updated at ASCO was, uh, was more follow-up, the progression-free survival two data, um, to look and see whether or not the beneficial effects uh, were carried through. And this is, I would argue, particularly important for an immunotherapy. So the promise of immunotherapy has traditionally been uh, not necessarily just that you would uh, have somebody have a response to a drug, but that this response would be durable. And so I, I think that made this updated analysis of Keynote 189 particularly important. And what was seen in this update um, really was that the results that were seen at uh, the original publication of the data at that uh, first interim analysis really were maintained with very similar results, um, both for overall uh, survival, progression-free survival, um, as well as overall survival in the three subsets and progression-free survival in the three subsets. Again, those are subsets based on PDL1 expression. And again, those subsets are patients who have standing for PDL1 in at least half of their cells, patients who have standing for PDL1 in a minority of their cells, and patients who have no uh, PDL1 standing. The PFS2, um, again, was very impressive. The hazard ratio there was 0.5. Uh, again, strongly supporting uh, the, the use of pembrolizumab in this regimen. Uh, in addition, the safety data really, uh, which looked quite good at the initial uh, publication, uh, really did hold up. There were uh, sort of minor differences in overall uh, adverse events. Uh, the one place, maybe two places where you did see a difference is that there were more patients clearly who discontinued at least one of the study therapies uh, due to an adverse event in the pem pembrolizumab arm as, a, as opposed to the placebo arm. Um, and similarly, not surprisingly, there were more immune-related adverse events in the people who received pembrolizumab as opposed to those who were on the placebo arm. I think that in terms of the people needing to discontinue a drug uh, secondary to an adverse event. I think that that data, uh, although disparate and certainly favoring placebo over uh, pembrolizumab arm, um, really has to be taken into the context of the fact that there were significant disparities overall in the length of time that patients received treatment if they received uh, uh, pembrolizumab versus if they receive placebo. So as you can imagine, if um, somebody is likely to be nearly uh, twice as long on therapy, there's more opportunity to discontinue one of the drugs for an adverse event as opposed to if they were on uh, therapy for a shorter period of time. So um, I think that if one wants to contextualize this data, um, we have seen uh, other data sets of chemoimmunotherapy uh, as well, and many of those data sets uh, presented data with longer follow-up. One major question that I think is an important one was whether or not the Keynote 189 would show um, its very impressive results uh, with longer follow-up. And I, I think this showed that the answer to that question is clearly yes. Um, overall survival, progression-free survival, as, as well as this PFS2 or progression-free survival 2 endpoint, all continue to strongly favor uh, pembrolizumab along with uh, the chemotherapy as opposed to chemotherapy alone. Um, and this, uh, this was again maintained with a longer follow-up. Um, of course, this will be an important benchmark. There uh, was other data presented at this year's ASCO uh, that uh, focused on longer-term follow-up for the Checkmate 227 study, which incorporates ipilimumab uh, uh, along with nivolumab, so CTLA-4 inhibitor along with PD-1 inhibitor. Um, also, there was data from the 9LA study, which uh, looked at those two immune checkpoint inhibitors along with two cycles of chemotherapy. Uh, as I mentioned, there are other chemoimmunotherapy studies that have read out to date, as well as additional studies that are anticipated to read out in the coming years. And so I think that this, uh, that this data is going to be 
uh, an important benchmark for people to, to look at when gauging the efficacy and toxicity profile of, uh, of these other regimens uh, so that we can make the most appropriate uh, treatment decisions for our patients who are uh, receiving their initial therapy for advanced non-small cell lung cancer and whose tumors do not harbor an EGFR mutation or an ALK gene rearrangement, as those are two populations um, that were excluded from this analysis. They were not enrolled in the study.